does the cross of Jesus Christ mean to me? Do you remember it was on November the 25th, 2004, that Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, opened in theaters around the world? It is said within the first six weeks, it was seen by some 30 million people. It brought in some $350 million, making it the second largest grossing film of the year. Yet rarely has a film created such controversy and yet at the same time such interest. In fact, it is said that that movie was banned by the Jewish community, it was accepted by the Islamic community, and it was praised by Christians around the world. But this film, which vividly portrays the last 12 hours of the life of Christ, has made an unbelievable impact. In fact, it is said that some who watched the movie were saved, others committed their life to Christ, and some were just flat out changed, like 21-year-old Dan Leach of Texas. It is said that after watching the movie, The Passion of the Christ, he turned himself in to the Texas Police Department, where he admitted to killing his 19-year-old pregnant girlfriend. When asked why, he said, well, after watching the movie, The Passion, Passion, Passion of the Christ, he said, I just simply felt remorse for what I did. Friends, why is it that 2,000 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is Jesus still having a worldwide appeal and making a global impact? What is it about the person of Jesus Christ that seems to, to mystify so many? Why is it that there have been more books printed, more movies made, more pictures painted, and more songs sung about Jesus Christ than any other figure in human history? You know, some years ago, John Lennon of Beatle fame made this shocking statement about Jesus Christ and Christianity, and here's what he said. He said, Christianity will go and it will vanish and shrink. We, the Beatles, are more popular than Jesus now, and I don't know who will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Well, friends, I have news for you. Jesus Christ is alive and well, and so is Christianity in the 21st century. In fact, did you know that more people are interested in Jesus Christ right now than ever before? In fact, a few years ago, the History Channel came out with a movie entitled The Bible, and it was seen by over 100 million people. In fact, it created such interest that they uh, they created a series, or uh, another movie called The Son of God, and it opened on February the 28th, 2014, and it made more money, and it was seen by more people than any other per movie in that year. So why is it that Jesus Christ and Christianity continue to have a growing attraction? Well, here's the answer. Simply because there has never, ever been anybody like the person of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ is not just a, a mere man. Jesus is not just a prophet. He's not just a great humanitarian. He wasn't a man that became a God, but Jesus Christ is God who for a short time came to this earth as a man. And his impact upon men and women throughout the centuries is simply because of what he did for you and I on the cross. You see, one of the most important questions in life, in fact, I think it's a question that everybody will eventually ask, is this question, what does the cross of Jesus Christ mean to me? You see, tragically to most people, the cross of Jesus Christ is nothing more than a fashion accessory that maybe dangles from the ear or hangs around the neck on a chain. But I think if we were to ask the average person today, hey, what does the cross of Jesus Christ mean to you? I think we would receive a variety of answers. You see, to the religious man, he might say, well, the cross of Jesus Christ is a symbol of Christianity. To the historian, he might say, well, it was an example of Roman justice. The atheist might say, well, the cross of Jesus Christ is where Jesus the man was martyred. But friends, if we could ask an eyewitness, if we could ask somebody who was there when Jesus Christ was crucified, we would receive an entirely different answer. In fact, if we, could re if we could ask that Roman centurion who nailed Jesus Christ to the cross, here's what he would say, because here's what he did say, recorded for us in Matthew 27 and verse 54. He said, truly, this was the Son of God. And I want us to consider that question today. What does the cross of Jesus Christ mean to you? Because, you see, your answer to that question carries 
eternal consequences. So let's think about that. What does the cross of Jesus Christ mean to me? Now, when we're thinking about the cross, it is important to realize that the cross of Jesus Christ was no accident. Jesus wasn't the unfortunate victim of some unfortunate circumstance. He was not taken by surprise the night he was captured in the Garden of Gethsemane. But the Bible tells us that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was the plan of God from the foundation of the world. In fact, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 records it this way. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You see, long before you and I were a twinkle in our mother's eye, God planned and God prepared that Jesus Christ would come and die on a cross. In fact, Jesus often warned his disciples of his coming death. Do you remember what he said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 18 and 19? He said this, he said to his disciples, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and a son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests, to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Now, those are the words of Jesus. And that statement is amazing because that statement alone reminds us that Jesus Christ is not a mere man that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because not only did Jesus predict his own death, do you realize he predicted where he would die, the city of Jerusalem? He actually told us how it would happen. He said that he would be betrayed, he would be condemned, he would be mocked, he would be scourged, and he would be crucified. And then he predicted that three days later he would rise from the dead. And do you realize that such accurate predictions prove to us that Jesus Christ is not just a mere man, but he is the Son of God. So how did it happen? How did the Son of God make it to Calvary's cross? Well, you remember it was in the early morning of April the 3rd, AD 33, that a detachment of Roman soldiers and temple guards led by Judas Iscariot came into the Garden of Gethsemane, and there on trumped-up charges, Jesus Christ was arrested. He was bound and led to stand trial before the Jewish high council and the religious rulers being jealous of his popularity and being convicted of their religious hypocrisy by the righteous teaching and righteous life of Jesus Christ. They convicted him of blasphemy and they sentenced Jesus Christ to death. Now, those religious leaders who condemned him of blasphemy and sentenced him to death they didn't reject Jesus because they thought Jesus Christ was a fake, a phony, or a fraud. In fact, remember, these men, these religious leaders who condemned Jesus, they saw his miracles. They saw his righteous laws. They saw him perform signs and wonders and miracles. And so they didn't reject him because he thought they thought he was a fake. You know, they rejected him because his righteous life exposed and confronted their unrighteous living. And you know, in the same way today, people do not reject Jesus Christ because they think he's a fake, a phony, or a fraud. In fact, did you know that there is more evidence that Jesus was crucified and on the third day that he rose again than there, er, than there is that Julius Caesar ever lived? There's more evidence of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ than, than there is that Alexander the Great died at the age of 33. There's more evidence that Jesus Christ died and rose again on the third day than there is that William Shakespeare wrote the plays that bear his name. So people don't reject Jesus due to a lack of evidence. But you see, people reject Jesus today because they just don't want to believe. People reject Jesus today simply because they do not want a righteous God telling them what to do. Well, these religious leaders, unable to carry out their decree of execution, because remember the Jewish world here lived under the jurisdiction of the godless Roman Empire, they sent Jesus Christ to Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea. Remember, Pilate, seeing his innocence and not wanting to get involved, he sent Jesus to Herod, who was the governor of Galilee. And Herod, like Pilate, seeing that Jesus was innocent of these charges, simply mocked Jesus, and they sent Jesus back to Pilate. 
Well, the Jews now got a little concerned. Jesus went from Pilate to Herod, from Herod back to Pilate. They, thinking that Jesus was, was going to get off, these religious leaders came to Pilate and they threatened him. They said, listen, we have proven that he is blasphemous and that if you do not condemn him to death, we are going to appeal to Caesar and we're going to charge you with treason. Well, as you can well imagine, Pilate found himself in the horns of a dilemma uncertain what to do, knowing that if you let him off, which was the right thing to do, that he himself would be put to death. And so, being weak need and of an equally weak back, he gave in to their cry, and there he condemned Jesus Christ to death. But before Pilate could actually send Jesus to the cross, as was the custom, Jesus Christ would be scourged. And scourging was something that took place publicly for all to see. So Jesus would be stripped of all of his clothing, his hands would be bound, and they would be, uh, they would be tied to the top of a post so he could not defend himself. The instrument of scourging would be a one-foot uh, wooden, uh, one, uh, one foot piece of wood, and coming out of that wood would be three leather straps. And embedded into those leather straps would be bits of bone and, and bits of metal, and that executioner would take that cat of nine tails, and he would bring it down upon the back of his victim. Those three-foot leather cords would wrap around the body, and those bits of bone and metal would embed themselves into the body, and he would yank it downward, thus ripping the skin, oftentimes exposing vital organs and bones. And this was done 39 times. And nobody was expected to survive 39 stripes of the cat of nine tails. In fact, when a criminal underwent scourging, the moment he confessed his crime, the scourging would stop. But remember, Jesus Christ committed no crimes. Jesus Christ broke no laws. In fact, the Bible reminds us that Jesus Christ lived a sinless, perfect life. That's why he could die for you on the cross. In fact, that's why Peter said these words about Jesus, that Jesus knew no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth. Historians say that scourging was so brutal that if a victim actually survived the 39 stripes of a cat at nine tails, they did so just barely, and they would be left a mass of mutilated human flesh. And maybe that's why Isaiah, speaking of Jesus Christ, said these words in Isaiah 53 and verse 2. They said, Jesus, he has no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Friends, his body was literally mutilated by that cat of nine tails. And so once the scourging was finished, Jesus now barely alive, Pilate would take this now beaten, broken, and bloodied body, and he would bring it before those his accusers. And he did it hoping to elicit some sense of sympathy within their hearts, that they would cry out and say, enough is enough. But you see, that didn't happen. Instead, these his accusers cried out and they said, let him be crucified. May his blood be upon us and may his blood be upon our children. And after the scourging, Jesus would be taken by these Roman soldiers into their own quarters. And there, as you can well imagine, Jesus would be quickly surrounded by some 600 Roman soldiers. Imagine the scene in your mind, 600 Roman soldiers in uniform forming a large circle around Jesus. And these Roman soldiers obviously knew that Jesus had been sentenced to death. They began to mock Jesus. They knew that he had been convicted of treason, claiming to be the king of the Jews. And so using Jesus as sport like a schoolboy torturing a, a small animal, they began to mock him. And I can imagine them saying, Jesus, if you claim to be a king, a king needs a robe. And so they placed a, a robe upon his back. And so Jesus, if you being a king, a king needs a crown. And so they took a row of thorns and they wove it into a crown and there they placed it upon his brow. Now those thorns would be an inch thick and they would be poisonous to the prick. Not enough to kill a man, but it would cause severe swelling in the head. Jesus, if you being a king, a king needs a scepter, and so they placed a wooden reed within his hands. And there, 600 Roman soldiers would bow to their knee, and in a mocking manner, they would cry out, Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews! And when their sport was over, one grabbed that wooden reed and began to hit Jesus in the head. Others began to slap him in the face, spit upon him, and others pulled his beard 
from his face as if to say, Jesus, if you are king, where is your army? Jesus, if you are king, where are the men to save you and to protect you from us? And yet what these Roman soldiers fail to realize is that Jesus Christ was a king and Jesus had a vast army of angels who could come at his any beck or call. Remember when Jesus was arrested there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Peter, wanting to defend his Lord, pulled out his sword. And remember what Jesus said? It's recorded in Matthew 26 and verse 53. He says, Peter, do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions. There are 600 soldiers in a legion. And Jesus was simply saying to Peter, Peter, do you not realize that right now at my disposal are 72,000 angels who could come to my aid? And by the way, angels are powerful beings. The Old Testament reminds us that one angel destroyed 185,000 of Israel's enemy. So Jesus was a king. And Jesus had a vast and powerful army. So why didn't Jesus call this army? Why didn't Jesus call these angels to come to his aid to stop this mockery, to stop this scourging? The answer is because, you see, death was Jesus' destiny. Jesus Christ came to die. So when the mocking was over, these Roman soldiers placed a placard around his neck, thus stating the charge. Now Jesus stationed between four Roman soldiers. They placed a 300-pound beam, a wooden beam upon his shoulder, the instrument of his own execution. And there this, this mass of mutilated humanity would slowly make his way up the Via Della Rosa to the place the Bible calls Calvary. When Jesus made it to Calvary, the Roman soldiers would lay Jesus' body upon that wooden beam. And there they offered him, the Bible says, gall mixed with wine. Now remember, gall was a drug and the Roman soldiers would give it to a criminal to temporarily knock them out. But they wouldn't knock them out because they were being sympathetic or trying to ease the pain. You see, they just knew that it was easier to, easier to take a seven-inch metal spike and drive it through their limbs in the life of a person who was knocked out rather than alive. And so they offered Jesus this gall so they could knock him out so he wouldn't squirm as they pounded these metal, metal nails into his limbs. But you see, Jesus, you remember, he, he rejected the gall because he desired to feel and to experience the full effects of the pain and the shame of Calvary's cross. And after they drove these spikes through the arch of his feet and through the wrists on his arms, they raised him up, and there Jesus Christ for the next few hours would suffer and die upon that cross. And Jesus would hold himself up there upon that that metal spike that was placed in the top of his feet. And there he would hold he'd hold himself up for as long as he could. And when his energy gave out, Jesus would slip back down that wooden beam, his mutilated back slugging across that, that, that splintered wooden beam. And there Jesus, when he got the energy, he would push himself back up. And there he would take in deep breaths of cool air. And when his energy gave up, he would fall. And this would go on hour after hour after hour, and eventually Jesus would collapse. And unable to push himself up and to take it in the air, Jesus would eventually die, and he would die of suffocation. And I know that this is a tragic picture of what Jesus Christ went through on the cross. But why did he do it? Why did Jesus Christ allow himself to be scourged, to be mocked, and to be crucified? The answer is simply because Jesus Christ died on that cross that he might save us from our sin and that we might right now begin living for him. Do you know that by the time that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, the Roman government had already crucified some 30,000 people and many of those, like Jesus, were innocent of the crimes leveled against them. But you realize that of those 30,000 people crucified, the world only remembers one, and that's Jesus Christ. Because only Jesus Christ died upon that cross for your sin. He died to be our Savior. That's why Isaiah made this statement in Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He said that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Paul put it this way in Romans 5 and verse 8, that God demonstrated his love for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Hey, that's why he went to Calvary. He died to be our Savior. Do you remember when Jesus was crucified? He was crucified between two thieves. Do you remember these two thieves were not common criminals, but these were the worst of the worst. These were the lowest of the low. These were the kind of men who would break into a home and not just rob, but in the process that they would, they would rape, they would torture, and they would even kill. And although these men, these two thieves, were dying for their own sin, they began to join the crowd in mocking Jesus as Jesus was upon that cross. They said, Jesus, if you are the Son of God, then come down off that cross. And yet Jesus never answered. But he did lift his, his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. And when those words came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ, look at like an arrow, one of those thieves was shot in the heart and instantly he realized that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He was the Savior of the world. And there with that cry of conversion, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom today. And there with that promise of salvation, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And friends, you realize it's important for us to realize that salvation can happen just that quickly because it's a simple choice to believe. It is worth noting that both these criminals had the opportunity to believe and to be saved. Both heard the witness of Jesus Christ, but the scripture records that although both heard, only one believed and the other didn't. Because it's not hearing about Jesus Christ that saves us from our sin and removes and, and, and gives us everlasting life. It is hearing and believing. It's not what a person knows about Jesus Christ that washes away our sin and gives us everlasting life. It is knowing about him and what he did for us and then trusting him and him alone to be our savior. It's hearing and believing. It's hearing and trusting. In fact, Jesus Put it this way in John chapter 5 and verse 24. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, that he who hears my word and believes in me has everlasting life, and he shall not come into condemnation, but he passes from death unto life. You see, of these two thieves, both heard, but only one believed. And that one who believed today is in heaven, and that one who heard and didn't believe today is in hell. Because it's not what you know about Jesus Christ that gets you to heaven. Friends, it's what you do with Jesus Christ. And so the question I ask you today, have you placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? It's not knowing about him. You see, you can know about Jesus and still die and, and go to hell. Maybe that's where you are today. You see, maybe you know about him. I mean, you know that he loves you. You know that he died for you. You know that he rose again. But there is in your soul, there's no confidence that you're on your way to heaven. No certainty that your sins are forgiven. Because it's not just knowing, it's knowing and trusting. And friends, listen, it's trusting in Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Do you remember what Jesus said? This is a great Bible verse. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way. I am the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Hey, that's an amazing statement. Jesus says, no one gets to God except through me. Listen, how could Jesus make such a statement? I mean, it seems pretty arrogant. It seems pretty prideful. Friends, but we need to remember, only Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven. Only Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. And only Jesus Christ went to the cross and there died for your sins and on the third day rose again. You see, Jesus, by his death and his resurrection, has the right to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. You see, we don't get to heaven by trusting Jesus plus ourself. It's trusting in Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. If there's any other way to get to heaven apart from Jesus Christ, then why did Jesus Christ die? Why did he have to die? You see, he died and he had to die because there is no other way. You don't get to heaven on your own. You don't get to heaven by your own good works. It's not what you do 
that get you to heaven, but it's you trusting what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's why we have the story of the cross. It reminds us that God made a way of escape for us. You know, the scripture says this in Hebrews 2 and verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The great salvation is what God did for us, sending his son Jesus. And all you need to do in order to have that great salvation is to repent of your sin and in faith trust Jesus and Jesus Christ alone to be your savior. And friends, if you don't do that, you will not escape the penalty of God. Hey, listen, you will pay for your sin and that payment will be made in hell or you can let someone else pay for your sin and that's Jesus Christ and he's already paid for your sin. All you need to do is by faith accept it. That's why the Bible says that God so loved the world, that's you. That whosoever believes in him, that's Jesus, they shall not perish but have everlasting life. So I ask you a question, have you made that choice to believe in him. Are you trusting in Jesus and Jesus Christ alone to be your savior? You see, many people, I'm afraid, they say, I believe in Jesus, and yet they wanna be, they wanna be sure and careful. They say, but I'm also believing in myself. Listen, you didn't die on the cross for your sins. You didn't rise from the dead. It's not your good works that get you to heaven, but the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. It's not by our good works that saves us, but it's by his good work. Not you trusting you, but it's you trusting him. Hey, that's why Jesus Christ died. He died to pay for your sin, and he rose again on the third day, proving he can do exactly what he claimed to do, and that's to bring you to the Father. So let me conclude with this. Maybe you're listening to this message, and you're not certain that your sins are forgiven. You're not confident that you're on your way to heaven. Maybe today, like those thieves, you know about Jesus, I mean, you know that he died for your sins. You know that he rose again. But there is in your heart some uncertainty. There's no confidence that your sins are forgiven on your way to heaven. And maybe that's simply because you know about him, but you are not trusting him as your savior. But that's exactly what you need to do. You need to place your trust in him. Jesus said in John 3 and verse 18, he says, he that believes in him is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the only begotten Son of God, and that is Jesus Christ. And so maybe today you need to place your trust in him, and you're saying, well, how do I do that? Well, it's very simple. First of all, you need to acknowledge yourself as a sinner. And once you've acknowledged yourself as a sinner, saying, Lord, I know th that I'm a sinner, and realize that your sin has separated you from God, but God in his love for you sent Jesus Christ into this earth and Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He went to a cross and there he died for your sin. And having died for your sin, God says now, believe in him and say, Jesus, I'm gonna trust you to be my savior. I'm gonna trust you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. And so maybe that's a decision that you need to make. And trusting him, the decision that you need to make, if that's a decision that you need to make, I wanna help you make that decision right now. And so I want to, I just want to lead you in a very simple prayer of faith. Now, prayer does not save you. Prayer is not a savior. Jesus is the savior. But prayer is you simply calling upon Jesus and you asking Jesus to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. So maybe you're listening and you're not certain your sins are forgiven. You're not confident that you're on your way to heaven. You know about him, but you're not trusted him and you want to trust him right now. Then I invite you to pray this prayer of faith with me right now. Say this, say, Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. And I know that you came and died for my sin. I realize I cannot save myself. So right now I place my faith in you and you alone to be my savior and to be my Lord. Would you save me from my sin? Would you give me everlasting life? Jesus, thank you for your death on my behalf. Help me now to live my life for you. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer on the authority of God's word, I want you to know something. 
you have everlasting life. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you made that decision, I just want to rejoice with you. And I want to have a word of prayer for you right now. Lord, I just want to pray for those who have made that simple choice to trust you as their Savior. Would you fill them with your Spirit, enable them to live for you, and give them the confidence that their sins are forgiven and heaven is now their eternal home. Take your words, speak to their hearts, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, the next step in your walk and relationship with Jesus is just to get to know him better. Hey, listen, I, I pray that this very simple message, what does the cross of Jesus Christ mean to me, has made a difference in your life. Jesus Christ came and he died for our sin that we might have life and that we might have life abundantly now and an eternal life with God in the future. And may that life be your life. Hey, God bless you today. Praising the Lord for his word. And let's continue to worship him with this song. Smile.
you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. It's where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Teach my soul to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay, yeah. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness. Church, salamat kayo sa inyong participation sa atong worship service online or maybe in your pocket groups. And if you want to continue uh, to help the church para makapadayon ta sa gusto'y pabuhat sa ginoo nato, you can send your offering or give your offering to the members of the Cash Point team or send it to our church bank account. And don't forget to like our Facebook page or subscribe to our YouTube channel para ma-updated mo if not a new content I upload. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will use the sermon that you've heard and the fellowship with your co-believers in the church uh, to help you live for Him this week. God bless you.